Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I am interviewing a friend of mine who had a weed-induced psychosis occur in their life. After we've covered this recent story in the news, I thought, why not bring someone on who actually had the lived experience? So thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, thanks for having me and letting me share my story. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm a little nervous because I know it's so personal, but I have a bunch of questions that the audience sent to us. So at least we have a place um, to start with. And right away, they want to know sort of the initial story leading up to the psychosis. So maybe you could tell us like a little bit about you and then maybe what led up to you realizing you were sick. Yeah, I thought I could start with just some background information on my relationship with weed. Um, I had smoked weed a couple of times in high school and, um, you know, I thought it was cool, but it was not a big deal to me. It was just like a fun experience. And then around 23 years old, um, I started smoking a little bit more regularly. That was around the time where it became legalized in California, so Mm. it was more regular available and um, smoking using vapes became more common and it was just a lot more convenient. Um, I started off smoking maybe like on the weekends, but as stress started occurring in my personal life, I started smoking more and more to manage anxiety symptoms. Um, And then it ended up becoming a daily habit for me for about three years. Um, There were periods where I would try to quit um within those three years but generally i was i was smoking regularly um for a few years um now leading up to the psychotic episode i did start experiencing generalized paranoia but i was not aware of it was that the Um, like a weed like a normal weed paranoia that's a good question i had never experienced um paran like paranoia as a result of getting high. Like I had, I had witnessed it from other people kind of tripping out or freaking out mm-hmm. after they smoked. And I didn't understand what they were going through because I was always pretty much chilling every time I smoked. Um, never, so you was, never got like nervous or like a little afraid or you well, never? The only time I ever felt nervous or paranoid was the very first time I got high in high school mm. because all of my friends started whispering about how maybe there were cops outside of the house <laughs> One of my friends was like, don't do that. You're going to freak out so-and-so because it's her first time smoking weed. Don't freak her out. And him saying, don't freak her out, started freaking me out. So the only time I remember experiencing paranoia while I was high. But the type of paranoia that I started experiencing leading up to the episode, I only recognized in retrospect. Mm. I was at, like, weeks leading up to the episode, I started getting, like, turning into almost like a conspiracy theorist where I thought that the whole world was going to end or I thought that like the government was out to get us or that I was some kind of like savior for the planet or that I was going to change the world for the better. Like I just started talking nonsense and I was not that I was doing that. I was also starting to get scared of hospitals. Like I I needed to schedule a colonoscopy for myself Mm. and I called and scheduled the appointment and then I promptly canceled because I had this fear that I was going to get raped in the mm. operating which is, you know, I know that sexual assault does happen in those kinds of settings. Um, but like normally I would be able to rationalize and say the likelihood is low. There's other adults in the room. There's, yeah. there's a place to protect us. And you know what? Like you got to do what you got to do. You got to get these appointments done. But I, I, my paranoia superseded the rationalization. I, I would cancel appointments because I was I was scared. Well, then I'm curious because I, I, I know when people think about paranoia, there's like an image we have in our head. And then we, you know, because a lot of people feel anxiety or fear, or like, you know, oh, I'm going to die in the roller coaster. Like I can't go on a roller coaster. So, ha- but then you calmly like talk yourself down. You have like a good open dialogue with yourself. So how did you, or did you know, I guess, leading up to the episode what was the difference from like a reasonable fear thought and like a con- what you said, conspiracy theory thought. And then, cause like obviously conspiracy theorists kind of sound like they're under psychosis, which some of them probably are, but most of them are just very uneducated. Right. But you're an educated right. person. So how did you know being an educated person that like, you know, what was your thought process between what was real and what wasn't leading up to the episode? Well, I didn't at the time even recognize that I was, like making decisions based off of those paranoid thoughts. Like okay. I 
super distinctly having it in the back of my mind. Like, what if they hurt me while I'm in that operating room? What if I'm, like, assaulted? What if this? What if that? And I remember canceling the appointment, but just telling myself, oh, I just don't want to go. Like, I just don't want to go. Like, I wasn't fully consciously aware that those thoughts were influencing my choices, if that makes sense. Yeah, but were and, you high Were you high when you were having the thoughts or even when you were sober you were having the thoughts? And when I was sober. Even when you were both. sober. And when I was sober. Arguably, maybe more so when I was sober. Huh. That I was, like, because when I was high, I remember kind of just, like, chilling out and kind of relaxing. But the paranoia, again, in retrospect, I, I was experiencing outside of being high. Yeah. And this was uh, during COVID, right? This was during the lockdowns? Yeah, this was during quarantine time. So Okay, so was, you were like isolated. I was isolated and I wasn't seeing anyone because I was I was renting a room with a family but completely unrelated to me and strangers. So I was pretty much just by myself during that period of time. And how much do you think that like contributed maybe to the paranoia? I think a lot. I think just generally having this virus out there that we, none of us understood exactly how harmful it was and this whole lockdown situation, I think, did, of course, contribute to my overall anxiety and fear. Yeah. And remind me, how old were you when it was happening? I was 26. Okay, so, so 26. I, yeah, I started smoking like late 23 early 24 ish around mm -hmm. that all right and then i'm smoking regularly um no known paranoia no known psychosis as a result of smoking and then just uh, i would say like three weeks to four weeks up to the episode episode i started experiencing an increase uh like generalized anxiety generalized paranoia another thing that started happening before the episode was my brain was thinking more I want to say woo-woo, mm -hmm. more spirit, where I would see things and take it as signs. And just to give people context, I am not the type of person to read into things. I'm, I, I consider myself a pretty rational person. Growing up, people would tell me that I, like, my, the way my thought process worked was like a computer, or I've been called a robot, like a friendly robot by my friends, because the way I th see things as a matter of fact. I've never been into astrology. I... Uh, I've, I've been an atheist for a very long time. And so um, I'm not the type of person to read into things or assume that the universe is sending me a sign. But I started kind of being one of those people where I would see like a bird and I'd be like, that's the universe telling me I'm going to be just fine. You know, like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, wait, because this is, uh, we recently have been talking about in my content, like spiritual psychosis, which there's all types of ways to trigger the psychosis. But with you, would you say the spirituality triggered the psychosis or the weed triggered the psychosis? Or do you, do you think the weed triggered the psych, like the paranoia that led to the conspiracy theory thoughts? I think, I think in my experience, weed really like opened up my imagination in a lot of ways. And I think it did open up certain things in my brain to allow me to access like what other people would consider spiritual experiences. Mm. Completely clean. There's like a, a filter that exists in my brain that kind of allows me to rationalize. But when I was smoking all the time, I felt like that filter was like removed and mm -hmm. I couldn't, or it was just like, I was giving in. So those instincts, you know, of that's a sign, you know, I'm being spoken to. And I think, of course, being that open, you know how people say, like, don't be so like, oh, you're so open minded that your mind falls out or your brain falls mm -hmm. out. That's felt to me where I was like so open to these kinds of things that it just didn't even make sense anymore. And I want to say that openness kind of led to me believing and feeding into delusions. Um, I don't think that the spiritual connections or whatever caused the psychosis. I think to answer your question, I do think it was prompted by marijuana. Yeah. All of it, the spiritual, the conspiracy theory, and then the full-blown psychotic episode was all triggered by the marijuana, the way it interacted with my brain at least. Yeah. Now there seems to be some overlap with marijuana induced psychosis and like schizophrenia and bipolar but specifically like schizophrenia did you have any diagnosis diagnoses before the episode that would have correlated with like paranoia delusion or anything like that no the only thing i had been diagnosed with beforehand was generalized anxiety disorder 
Okay. Okay, which I think is not only common, but I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like a lot of people do weed and marijuana to sort of calm them down or they tend, it can cause paranoia and anxiety in some people, but I think some people with anxiety even say marijuana helps. Yeah, that's part of the reason I started smoking more regularly. I think actually my diagnosis of anxiety uh, enabled me to smoke more because Mm -hmm. of the narrative that weed helps lower anxiety. So I was I was telling myself I was using it as medicine for my anxiety. Okay. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, actually. So here you are, you're in a rented room, you're smoking. Oh, how are you smoking? What's the way you consumed it? That's a good question. Um, primarily vape, sometimes edibles, but mainly just vaping. And I would try to get the highest THC level possible when I go to the dispensary. I would tell the bud tender to like hook it up, like give me your recommendations. I loved these edibles. I think they were called TKO and they like got super stoned when I would take them. And the reason I was looking for such high concentrations is because, um, like I loved feeling super high. Like if I was going to get high, I wanted to be really stoned. And sometimes it would take a lot for me to get there. Like I would smoke with some of my friends and they would take a couple hits and be good. And I would take a couple hits and just feel like a little bit lightheaded. Like, nah, like I want to feel high. So I'd always try to get the high stuff, which is why it's so weird that I ended up experiencing full blown psychosis. Cause like I said, I had, seen people trip out on weed and I had never had that experience. We'd never had that effect on me. And I thought people who were freaking out from smoking were like just little bitches or something. Like they couldn't <laughs> handle you know what I mean? I'm like, you can't handle weed, like the most mild fucking substance that exists on the planet. Like how are you not able to handle yourself, girl? Like you're being dramatic. Like I cannot believe people would be freaking out over it. And then here I am a few years later just like in a full-blown psychotic episode, the cr- craziest thing that I've ever seen anyone experience on weed happened to me. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, as your friend and, like, somebody who was partially there to witness it, it was, like, the most shocking thing I ever saw happen on weed <laughs> like, or because of weed or – However you want to say it. So, okay. So, uh, vapes, highest concentration of THC. I think that's interesting. I don't think I processed that. Now, I, when I took edibles, you know, I'm living in Europe now, so I'm not on, I'm not doing marijuana, but uh, I was taking like, I don't know, like uh, 20 to 40 a night. And that would keep me like, that was a really good high for me. Uh, And I smoke a bong. But I stopped vapes actually during COVID myself because they were hurting my throat. So I stopped doing them. But I am curious, and I've done dabs, I've done all those other things, but I am curious, like, could, do you know the milligrams or the, 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 you don't know how powerful, you don't remember the edibles? I really could not tell you. I mm. want to say 40. Okay. Maybe. I can't, I can't, don't quote me on it, though. I don't remember at this point. Okay. Okay. That makes uh, sense. So, okay. So you're building up to the episode, I guess, to call it. Now, it it lasted for a bit, right? So what are how did you know the d- the difference between, like, leading up to the episode and ending? So I know, in retrospect, when the psychotic symptoms began, mm. like, pre- pretty precisely. Um, so we had this slow buildup, right? Several weeks of, like, slowly becoming a little bit more delusional, a little bit more, you know, conspiracy theorist. And then um, one morning uh, in a staff meeting, actually, it was my first week at a new job in my field. And it was a Zoom staff meeting because it was lockdown time. Sure. And, like over 50 staff members on that Zoom call. And I started experiencing a manic episode for the first and only time in my life. I'm sure I, I experienced mania during the psychotic episode sure. period. But as far as, like, outside of psychosis, that was the only time I ever experienced a manic episode. I started crying. I started interrupting my supervisor and my coworkers. I started just, like, saying things I would never say. Um, and I didn't even care. Uh, hmm. And I'm this staff member at this new place, and I'm just acting like I own the place, and, like, this is totally normal. I got off the call. And this was at like maybe 1 p.m. or so. I got up the call and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just cried on my first week of work. Like, that's crazy. And I'm <laughs> talking to a couple of my friends and they're like, okay, but like, are you okay? Like, is everything fine? I'm like, oh yeah, everything's fine. What do you mean? It happens. Like, people cry. People express themselves. It's fine. 
And then, um, wait, can I, I ask? Like, can I ask, uh-huh. like, what kinds of things were you saying? Um, yes, I was basically talking about how I'm like, uh, like a victim of the system, and this is the reason I hate our field because no one knows what it feels like to be someone like me. And that's not even my narrative, mm. that's really. Not even my experience. Yeah, I was just like basically like no one knows what it feels like to be me and I have all the answers and like if everyone just follows my system, like the world would be a better place. And so many staff members were being very sweet on the call, but I could obviously a lot of them were probably like, Ooh, this girl's yeah. going through, like this girl <laughs> she's going through some shit. Yeah. So okay. uh, hopefully that is your question. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So you had this build up and that's like your moment where you realize like, okay, if I had to look at back at the timeline, that is when I lost myself. No. So, mm. okay. So I, so that was a manic episode. And then later that night, maybe, I don't know, around like 10 PM, maybe later. I don't know. I was smoking. I was getting as high as humanly possible. And I was not high during the staff meeting, by the way. Yeah. I wanted I, I remember being stressed out in the meeting and wanting to smoke, but I was not high during work. But as soon as I got off work, I basically smoked from 4 p.m. all the way through to at least 10 p.m., maybe later. While I was smoking, it was the weirdest thing. I was just chilling, whatever, hanging out. And then all of a sudden, everything started looking like almost slow motion, like in a movie. And I made eye contact with my computer lens, my camera. I made eye contact and all of a sudden my brain was like, you are being watched. Mm. <laughs> this is when the psychotic episode, like, like definitively that's when psychosis in my mind started. I, I mean, some people would argue the symptoms leading up was the start, but as far as full blown, like I have literally no idea what's going on. It, ha- it happened in that moment. I was immediately, my brain was like, you are being watched by the CIA. And then all of a sudden, my Wi-Fi kept turning on and off and the way it was turning on and off was like uh, in a pattern, which I don't think was real. Like, I think my brain was like perceiving it going on. It wasn't actually like, I don't know, but um, I kept thinking that it going on and off was the government, like fucking with my Wi-Fi. And then um, the, the heat started turning on and I thought I was being poisoned. So I started getting a panic attack. And again, this was like the first time I had an actual panic attack. I had had anxiety attacks in the past, but this was the first panic attack where I thought I was dying. I thought I was being killed. I thought my heart was slowing down. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. So that's when I called my brother and um, I told him like, I think I'm going through a thing or maybe I called, did I call you or did I call my brother? I don't I'm remember. Not sh- I'm, I know we were in contact. I know your family was in contact, but I don't know like what timelines were what. I know I talked to both of you at some point, right? Probably. I had gotten in contact with you somehow. Maybe he told you I was going through it. I don't know. But um, basically my brother had told me just to calm down that it was just a panic attack and I'd be fine. And that helped. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm fine. Hang up the phone. I ended up calling 911 at some point, and then the uh, dispatcher on the other side sounded like, is nefarious the right word? Like bad, evil, malicious? Yeah, yeah what, well, ill-intentioned? Yeah, she sounded like evil, and so I didn't trust her. So I said, never mind, I'm just having a panic attack, I'll be fine, and I hung up, which drives me crazy, because I'm like, oh my gosh, I could have, like, you know, been taken to the hospital right away and be put on maybe antipsychotic meds or sure. something, like that would have helped or maybe it would have made it worse i have no idea but with all this being said uh i basically believed the government was out to get me that i was being watched that as soon as they found me they were going to murder me yeah so what i ended up doing i ended up getting into my car and at this point i think it was morning time it was like six in the morning five in the morning so i've been freaking out all freaking night and i hop in the car i haven't slept at all and in fact, I hadn't been sleeping for several days, apparently, leading up to this point. I didn't realize it, maybe because of the mania, but um, I got into my car, I drove to my parents' house, and then at my parents' house, I started, <laughs> I walked into their house, and they were playing, like, Christian music. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was taking a nap, and there was, like, Christian music playing, and I started thinking I was Jesus Christ, like, walking into the house. I was like, I'm Jesus Christ incarnate. So I took, is this, 
there's so much happened to be yeah. honest with you. Maybe I shouldn't go into all the details because it would take like eight hours of me explaining all these like little side narratives yeah. that yeah. out. But one of them was thinking I was Jesus Christ. And I went yeah. to my neighbor's um, I started stomping around the front yard. Your neighbor's house? house? Oh, <laughs> what did I say? Wait, did you go to your neighbor's house? Like back at your place or? Oh, my parents. Sorry. Was That's this when question. I was driving up eventually when I realized like when I was heading to your folks house? Like, is that that same story? Yeah, I think okay. this you had like we had, had a... communication mm-hmm. the night before and you knew something was really wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we had talked and you you were like talking about your activism stuff and you sounded like yourself, but not yourself. And I was like, huh. Like the oh, way, the active... yeah, there like was... there was so much. <laughs> there was a lot. So you, we had talked, and you were talking about like saving the world, and I was like, this sounds different than how you normally talk about activism. So I was like, and you know, I've been in social justice circles for so long. I've been in activism circles, so it's not abnormal for someone to talk about influencing the world in a positive way. But the way you were talking, it's like unless somebody knew you, I don't think they would have necessarily thought it was too weird but it was like the way you were talking about it like a little bit too unrealistic that I was like something feels way off so I called I think I think I called your family and then I said like hey you might want to go check on her something seems weird but then I think by the time we all met up and headed to your folks house like that was it like I think it was clear something was really off yeah I mean you knew that something was really wrong you're right I think you knew before I was even having the panic attack, if I remember correctly. I I, I knew and knew. It was like... Not to, like, come and get me. But it was when I started having the panic attack, and I had called my brother, and then you had called me, Mm -hmm. or whatever. That's when... That's when you knew, like, no, 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 she needs help. Something's wrong. Yeah. And so, yeah, I might have gone to my parents' house. You were already on your way, and you had already communicated with them. Yeah. Telling them something's wrong with your daughter. Like, I'm coming to help. Uh, yeah, so um, the the first day, the first morning of the episode, yeah, I was stopping around in front of my neighbor's house, and they were so sweet. They were like, honey, are, are you okay? So even they could tell? Oh, they knew right away something was not right with me. Mm. And they brought me over to their front yard. They, like, gave me a breakfast. And then I talked to um, – one of the adults there and i said have you ever had a spiritual experience and she was like yes and i was like i think i'm having one right now and Damn. she's like he goes yeah i don't think mine was quite like this but you know <laughs> <laughs> that's I, so sweet i might have even told her like i think i'm jesus christ because mm. <laughs> yeah i literally thought i was and again this is coming from an atheist for me to be coming out like oh jesus is the one so yeah that was the start (laughs) okay i think no no, i think this is a good place actually move to the questions because it will keep us from you're right there's like probably we could talk about this for hours and i don't want to overwhelm or derail us into too many tangents so do you mind if we refer to the questions yeah let's go for it okay and then answer them as like comfortable as you want obviously um because I, I know they're like kind of they're intimate questions and thank you to the audience who submitted them i think we both really appreciate that um Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, how did you perceive anything as it was happening? Like, what did it feel like? Because you were able to drive, which is, by the way, incredibly shocking as your friend. Like, I think the thing that makes me, like, want to cry is the idea that, like, you somehow managed to, like, drive a vehicle and not hurt anyone and end up at home. And you were able to, like, not hurt yourself. And you were able to, like do so much like I feel like luck like I'm not a spiritual person either so you know I would say like God was on your side or your guardian angel was on your side but I feel like luck was so on your side yeah I'm surprised I didn't hit anyone either but I think it's because I was so paranoid and like hyper like aware and I was like interesting like and I was driving carefully because I thought I was going to be murdered but you're right that could have gone either way right I yeah mean, did you have a did you feel like you had a choice in grabbing the keys uh, no I mean everything I was doing was on impulse and instinct it was like survive like I felt like I was working off of survival instincts like curious wait do you think you getting to your parents house was actually part of that survival because you knew they would take care of you 
Um, yeah, at that point, like, I didn't trust anyone but my family. Like, Sorry. I, I be home with my family because I couldn't trust the ho- I couldn't trust the 911 dispatcher. I couldn't trust the police. I couldn't trust the family I was living with. I thought sure. they were in on it. Um, but unfortunately, as the psychosis worsened, I started to feel the same way about my family, too. Yeah. So it, that, that, safe, that sensation or feeling of safety with my family only lasted so long. Mm. Okay, sorry to interrupt. So how, what did it feel like to be in it? Um, like, it depends on the day, to be honest. But I think generally it felt kind of like a dream. Like, like when I was driving, for example, um, you know, things on the side of the road kind of whooshed by, you know, things were definitely distorted slightly. I would say it was kind of similar to being being on an acid trip. Mm. Uh, And so, yeah, it it felt like a dream. It felt like I wasn't really in control of what I was doing, that I was just kind of like, like being, uh, like I was a puppet being moved by my brain or something. Like, I don't know how to explain it, but, um, yeah, time was definitely distorted. Like, some memories of mine are sped up because that's how I experienced it. It, like, happened, like, zoom. Like, people would move Interesting. from one to the other, like, like they were being sped up. Hmm. Uh, sounds were distorted, too. Like, the, like a, a garbage truck down the street sounded like it was in my living room. Like, I could hear, like, everything the garbage truck was doing. Like, it was right next to me. Or an ambulance would be going off miles away. And I felt like that ambulance was in my head. Um, so sound was distorted. Is that like and- um? Is there, like, an audible psychosis thing? Is that, like, a, just a symptom of psychosis? I know that your sensations kind of get thrown off. And that your brain will... Uh, as far as I understand, your brain, like, will perceive certain sounds as farther or closer, depending on whether they actually are farther or closer, but it can distort that. Like, mm-hmm. it can, like, that's thrown out of black, it can make it feel like things are much closer than they are, because whatever system, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, I guess whatever system manages that, gets mm-hmm. all thrown back. So. Okay. Uh, another thing that was distorted was um, people's faces. This was probably like the worst part of it was that um, people in uniform. So like police officers, EMTs, nurses, doctors, anyone in uniform who were, they were also wearing masks, by the way, because yeah. this was COVID. So all of those people looked kind of like humanoid gorillas with like these huge bulging eyes and these small eyebrows and these hunched shoulders, they all looked terrifying. Mm. And they all very, like, there's a word I'm looking for, malicious. That's not the word. Maybe someone knows what I'm Like insidious, I think, was the word. I think that's a good word. Malignant is malignant. No, malignant means, like, something that's there that's not supposed to be. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, insidious. They all looked very bad and intentioned. And, like, I couldn't trust them. Like, they were against me. So that was also a distortion I saw. And sometimes the family... And you would also look kind of like apes. I was going to ask, what about me? Did I look distorted at all? Yeah, like, we we looked like, um, we looked like the Neanderthals or something mm. to me. Like, we just didn't look like people. We just looked like a bunch of monkeys. It was very weird. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are we all just monkeys <laughs> um, at the end of the day? Um, okay, so then I'm curious, because um, I know at one point, I didn't stay the whole time during your psychosis I eventually had to leave because I wasn't actually a very good friend during the process I wasn't the calming energy you needed and so I'm so grateful that your family ended up being or at least your parents ended up being like this really calming energy for you um but I remember specifically a time when we did call you had asked us to like call the cops and because you wanted the right to leave and so we called this group of cops over and they were very like lovely about it but i remember you being so rebellious towards them do you remember yeah i i remember acting like a like the cop or the emt i don't remember which but he said you're oh she's acting like a teenager or something like that he called me a teenager and i was i was like rolling my eyes and like you know whatever um yeah i would go like back and forth between like i need 911 i need to get out of here and then as soon as the uh emts arrived i would switch to their evil and you can't trust yeah. them so as soon as they arrived i was like i know what you're up to i know that you're not here to help me so i'm yeah. gonna completely and i would do the same thing at the hospital i would 
I mean, you remember I would scream for 911. There was one time my neighbors called 911 because I literally ran out of the house screaming 911 at the top of my lungs. So, um, you know, I'd get picked up or I'd be questioned and I would just shut down. I wouldn't talk to them. Yeah. At the too, you guys would take me to the hospital to try to get me help. And then the nurse would ask me questions and I would refuse to speak to them. So then yeah. uh, people asked if I was hospitalized too. Yeah. And I, we went to the hospital maybe like three times, three different times, but I was never hospitalized because they couldn't get enough information out of me to figure out what to do with me. And my family advocated saying that they would take me home. They didn't, they, my family didn't want me to be hospitalized because you know, they didn't know what kind of hospital I would be put into. I was there with your mom at one point where, um, and I've done this for a few of my friends in terms of like advocating for their mental health, but your case like blew up, like popped a bubble for me, if you will, because I'd never dealt with a friend of mine who had like psychosis. I've dealt with so many variations of mental health struggles and talked to parents and talked to cops. And I'd had an experience that I thought was going to, prepare me for this one, but it was very different. So I, I specifically remember a moment where we were at the hospital and the woman asked you like, have you had any weed lately? And you're like, no. And I was like, she has absolutely had weed. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you can talk to her. You can tell her weed's legal in the, in, in this state in California. You can say it. <laughs> Wait, say that again. Your audio cut out. I remember just like, no, shaking my head. Like, no, I'm not, yeah. not telling and we're like, I kept looking at you to like tell me what to do because I did not know what was yeah. going on. Well, I felt bad because your parents are like older and like all of our generation that has like older parents, I don't know how prepared they are to handle this. And I'm always like really impressed when they can handle it really well from like drugs to like their kids doing crazy millennial things. So there was this moment where like the doctor came in and told us like, if you tell your friend's symptoms to the nurse who's going to interview you, she'll be taken away and locked up and it's COVID. So she'll be sent to the nearest facility, which is by the way, all full. So it'll be the worst facility in town and you won't be able to see her cause it's COVID. And we were like, no, cause like the doctor was very, yeah, the doctors were really confident it was weed related psychosis. So they were, they recommended that we advocated for you and put you in a quiet, safe space at home. Because they were going to basically lock you up in a padded room and it was probably going to make it worse. So we decided not to speak to the lady and we did take you home uh, at the recommendation of the doctors. And your parents, you know, like I said, I wasn't the greatest friend at that time, which is eventually why I left it in their hands because um, I was so emotionally, I think, triggered myself as your friend because it was so weird to see you go in and out of like who you were. Like I remember one time... It was like really late at night and we were trying to have dinner and you were at the table doing things with your body and just like making faces and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you stopped and you like looked at us and you're like, hey, like what's going on? And I was like, and it was like you, it was like the real you. And I was like, oh my God. And I just remember like bursting into tears. I just remember like thinking like, oh my God, my best friend's back. Like my friend's back. Like my oh my gosh. And then you disappeared again. Yeah. It was so weird. Yeah. That's yeah. I remember that too. Like I do have memory of that specific interaction. Yeah. So you do remember it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, remember what I was remember it like? Places, you know, I know like I remember right out of the episode, I had talked to my brother about, what had happened and he explained like the timeline and i was like wow that's crazy because my timeline is different like i thought this happened first and then this happened and then there's some things that i don't remember at all but i do remember a lot of it but it feels like a dream like yeah. it, like when all of the memories it feels like i dreamt all of it like it didn't actually happen um but yeah i do remember that day i was getting a weird sensation Ugh, I don't even know like how TMI this is for viewers, but it was my experience. Um, I was getting this sensation like someone was raping me during the mm. episode. And so I remember at the table, I like reverted to normal and then it started happening again. And that's why I started saying, no, it's happening. It's happening. And then I went and I laid on the couch because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. I, thought I, was, I thought I was being raped by spirits. Like, I don't know why. 
I don't know why there was like this fear, like huge fear of sexual assault. I, I have had an experience in my personal life that's happened to me, but it was not rape. It was like nowhere near that. Mm. So I don't know exactly why my brain was like, had this huge fear or connection with um, sexual assault. But yeah, I thought that these spirits were after me and they were assaulting me. Um, yeah. And that happened um, when I had snapped back out of so like sober mind i guess do you think it's in any way like uh this sounds so weird but like gendered do you think like women just are constantly afraid of like assault like i was afraid to put you in a facility for that reason um well yeah you know like you know when you have a dream and it feels very random but sometimes you can tell why you dream certain things like sure. like like maybe in a dream you end up having sex with a platonic friend and you're like oh like, it's because I'm crushing on this one person, but I hung out with my friend this day. Yeah. And I, like, mixing it all together. So, like, you kind of know where it's coming from. I feel similarly about my psychotic episode where I'm like, okay, I can tell, like, where that thought came from. But then the psychosis blew it way out of proportion. So, for example, do women get sexually assaulted in hospitals? Do unconscious women get sexually Yes. And that's a real fear of mine. Like, genuinely, like, if I'm left in a hospital bed for four months in a coma, like who are the curves that are working at the hospital mm -hmm. know, you know same like no i think i think a lot of people especially with the recent data statistics coming out about it like there's that saying like women um aren't safe in life or death oof oof yeah that's rough. That's but rough. it's true it's true so okay and, um uh, especially mm -hmm. um m mentally ill women too yeah. have a lot of the abilities who can't advocate for themselves and right. especially experiencing psychotic symptoms i imagine are like one of the uh, most vulnerable victims to these things because who's going to believe a girl i was literally saying i was being raped by spirits like yeah. who's going to believe actually sexually assaulted i probably wouldn't even believe myself like i'd yeah. probably be like maybe i did just just hallucinate that i don't know you know yeah. like how what a scary position to be in as a woman for sure so that that moment when we were at the table together and like you came and you were kind of yourself again and then you slipped right back in. Did you feel distinctly different at all? Yeah, I did. It did feel like I was, I woke up for a second, mm. it, it, but I still wasn't fully there though. Yeah. Like, but you know, it did feel similarly to the day I came out of the episode where initially I, it felt like I was waking up from a dream, but I still didn't know what was going on. And then slowly as people started explaining stuff and I started putting things together, I had to accept that the last three to four weeks was real and not a dream. Um, but I wasn't ready in that moment with everyone staring at me, I think, uh, to accept that like what I was going through was real and it just, I got pulled back in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind if I continue on with the questions? Go for it. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, one of the questions we had, um, well, I guess this kind of, well, let's go with this one. Um, relating to marijuana use now, do you smoke today? Uh, I do not. I haven't smoked since the episode, but that was a really difficult thing for me to do because I've been so dependent on it so regularly for so long. Um, so um, I was very tempted to smoke again after the episode as much as I knew it was the wrong thing to do. I I came out of it and I would circle, um, I would go on drives and I would circle around dispensaries, yeah. like, you know, and at that time I wasn't fully convinced that it was the weed. I thought maybe I had schizophrenia or something else, um, because I just couldn't believe we could do that to anyone. Um, yeah. but then after doing my own research, I discovered that it is possible for some brains to have that interaction with the drug. And so, um, once I accepted that weed was the trigger for me or the prompt, uh, then I had to work really hard not to smoke it. I actually ended up going to MA meetings. It's Marijuana Anonymous, which I had considered long before the episode because I had a very unhealthy relationship with weed and I had looked into like other people with similar issues and Marijuana Anonymous popped up. And um, initially I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world. I was like, I will not be one of these meetings it's so corny and like the narrative is so religious and i hate that and da, da, da. so i didn't bother but then after the episode i was quite literally desperate like i was yeah. like i will go to the dispensary so i created a system for myself that if i wanted to go to the dispensary i had to 
go to at least one A or one MA meeting first. And if I still wanted to go to the dispensary, I could. Mm. But then I had those MA meetings and I heard people talk about their struggles and what their lives are looking like because they cannot stop smoking or what their financial situation is looking like. And as I met other people who had experienced the same thing I did, it really did encourage me not to go back to it. So yeah. I've been off of marijuana for over four years. Wait. Why was no. it that long ago? No, it's all, it's going to be four years in August. Wow. That's kind of amazing. It's been so long. Does it feel like it's been that long? Um. Yeah, it does to me now. It really does. It feels like forever ago that I lived that life and feels like it's been a long time since I've been high. Yeah. So... Um, I'm curious because I remember at the time we had done a lot of like, uh, again, like I was trying to be a friend and trying to like advocate for your mental health and trying to like contact therapists and we were trying to get doctors on the phones. And even I, as a friend, was like in disbelief when your doctors were like, this is weed induced psychosis. I was like, nah, (laughs) I refuse to believe this as a 420 advocate. Like I refuse to believe this as somebody who like loves her weed. Like there's no way. And so even I was like very frustrated with that diagnosis. Like I was very frustrated with that conclusion. And I know your doctors, like we talked to a few, we saw like a lot of people, um, like I said, your parents were such champions about the whole thing. They were really so amazing about it. Um, it was really stressful, like a lot of emotional labor, but I think your doctors were kind of like the most amazing part to me because they were so understanding and they just like in the weirdest way, we're able to see you and then get you the right medication and then help you on the right. Like you integrated back into normal life so much faster than I thought you could ever do. Yeah. Um, honestly, I have to give credit to everyone in my life at that time because everyone handled the situation with so much compassion and grace. Um, cause yeah, we had a doctor who, came in and made sure I had the medication I needed. And also he gave me the right documentation for work because I had just started this new job. Mm-hmm. And the first time that I'm starting, you know, in this field that I've worked very hard to be a part of and I've gone to school to be in this field and all this stuff. And so the doctor came in with the right documentation to get me on medical leave. My parents filed that paperwork with my employer um, were, I would have never been able to do that under my condition. Even my coworkers were awesome about the whole situation because um, when I came back to work, um, many of them just checked in with me and just said, hey, are you okay? And these people didn't even know it was brand new. I thought they were going to just like, you know, just, just write me off as this crazy lunatic lady. And instead they knew I was going through something. Um, and even my supervisors, they were so sweet. They were so sweet, like just genuinely really patient and like really giving. Um, and they gave me really good feedback after yeah. I started working. And so, um, and then of course my family that was, um, that was very advocating for me and making sure I was being taken care of. Like I, I feel very lucky that I have the support system I had. Yeah. And like even um, during because it was during COVID and lockdowns, I'm sure like every industry was aware of mental health at the time. I think a lot of people were trying to pay attention to burnout and to lockdowns and being alone and not socializing. So I think I forget like it happened during the lockdowns, like during that time where everyone was very like stay at home, don't socialize. And I think a lot of people felt the loneliness of that. But on top of that, I wonder how many other people were having like the cops told us that the surrounding mental hospitals were full. Like they told us, like people were booked. Hospitals were booked. Yeah, and actually um, I'm just putting together that um, the paranoid symptoms, I said, you know, it was like a three, three few weeks um, leading up to the episode. That's when I had started like hardcore isolation because even this, even though this was well into quarantine, I wasn't taking it as seriously as some people would have recommended at the time. Like, sure you know going to um, meet people online and I what else was I doing um oh I was going to my friend's house you know like stuff like that because I lived alone though I'm like what if you expect people who live by themselves just not to see anyone else like that's insane but mm. as I did start doing that though I was like I remember I, I'm a bad person mm-hmm. like I, I not being like taking this seriously enough i need to lock myself in and i started like ordering food in for every single meal i stopped going to the grocery store i stopped driving yeah i just house all together so and yeah i think 
after you read the symptoms. Well, I do remember talking to you because we didn't live in the same area anymore at the time. And like all my friends dispersed around this time into different places. And so it wasn't uncommon for me to be away from friends and family. But I think not all my friends were used to it. Like I had friends even in the East or Midwest who were really like suffering from loneliness during the pandemic. And for me, at least I was living with my, you know, my siblings. So that was really nice. Um, but you were living like alone. And so I remember talking to you and I remember saying like, go home to your family, bro. Go see your friend. Like, go see somebody. And I remember you saying something like, no, I'm going to be a bad person. I can't see people. It's quarantine. And I just remember thinking like, just go see somebody, bro. Like go see anybody, like anybody. Just like go see your family. And I, I know that it was tough because I know there was a social pressure you know, and I know that. And so I know that I'm going to assume that played into the paranoia. I'm going to assume that played into something. Absolutely. I mean, um, I want to say this, especially for people who are like probably screaming, it's not the weed. Don't blame the weed. That's not incorrect because there were a lot of factors that led up to the episode. And I think isolation was one of those factors. Stress um, of starting a new job, also stress in my personal life because I had ended a, a long-term relationship mm. and they moved into this place that I hadn't been living it for. I totally for, forgot that. Oh yeah. I was, it, I mean, it was I totally eight, forgot. And my whole life. Eight I years. This almost eight years. Yes. Yeah, wow. like, and my entire life changed as a result of that breakup and it's like COVID. So not only did I just lose my best friend in my life and now I'm by myself um, and then on top of it, I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't eating. And I didn't yeah. realize I had the fact of like taking care of myself altogether. Um, so, of course, there were all these factors. Uh, plus, I was smoking ex- like very heavily. So, all of those factors, I think, ultimately resulted in the psychotic episode, definitely. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like, um, it's like a, it felt like a perfect storm in some ways. You know what I mean? Like, nobody smokes thinking, um, they're going to hit a psychotic episode or hit psychosis. But I think it's like a, like almost like a perfect storm, which is why it's generally safe, right? Generally speaking, people won't have this happen. Yeah. But I will say this for people who are like, it's not the weed. I could have had all of those other factors and I would not have experienced psychosis if I was not smoking the way I was smoking. I agree. But just down to ultimately, that's why it is diagnosed as cannabis induced, because if that factor was removed i would have been fine i could have had another factor removed like maybe i um was stressed but i was getting enough sleep but i was stressed and smoking weed i could have easily still fallen into a psychotic episode as a result so um and that's not to say everyone would have that reaction most people will not but my brain chemistry my brain interacted with the drug a certain way and it resulted in that happening so yeah. Did the did the doctors ended up find did they find something that sort of like oh her brain type there's something other people can look for like not that I'm aware of no I think they're still trying to figure out what it is exactly um, but yeah I'm, I'm not, not that I'm aware of in case people are wondering about like diagnoses after the fact um it took four medical professionals for me to finally acknowledge that it was cannabis induced and it was always like the way they said it to me was so odd like it was clear cut it says cannabis induced psychosis um and then i worked with a therapist for over a year and she put me through a lot of different tests to see if i had bipolar or schizophrenia or any of that stuff and i i didn't end up getting diagnosed with any of that um but i was diagnosed with cannabis induced psychosis and then after the episode I continue to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety, but also additionally a major depressive disorder. Um, after? Yeah. After. I had not been, I, I had been tested for depression before the episode, but I was not um, clinically depressed. And then post episode, I had depression. Like That makes sense. Yeah. I, ha- I had never experienced suicidal thoughts in my entire life. And then in the episode, I wanted to die. Mm. Um, I remember. And- and after the episode, those thoughts can t- persisted, unfortunately. Yeah. If you're open to it, I do want to talk about those uh, unaliving <laughs> desires that you had. Um, because I know as a friend watching you, I knew you and I knew you weren't a person who had these – as a person who does. <laughs> I knew you weren't a person who ever wanted to unalive herself. Like that wasn't your narrative, you know? 
And so that was really weird. But I think that's why I knew also like this was so unique of an experience because I would watch you like I know your family and while I was staying with them, I would be on like we would be on like um, what's this called? Like we'd be on watch. We'd mm-hmm. have to sleep next to you or try to be next to you because you wouldn't sleep and then you'd run off and do things in the middle of the night. Like you'd run off, you know, you're just, out, you know, just in the middle of the night, you just run around and like you ran around kind of like a goblin, honestly, like you would be like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I looked crazy. Yeah. You definitely I... didn't look sober. Yeah. No, but you... I mean, not sober. I mean, like, yeah, I just, yeah. it looked. Was up something sure. was up so in particular i would witness you like try to throw yourself on the ground like i never heard a head hit the, the ground before but man the sound of your skull hitting the ground i did watch your video um on this beforehand like when it came out and you said that in that video and i don't remember actually hitting the ground that hard <laughs> I? I mean i don't think you got to hit it that hard for your skull to make that noise that's, that's fair, actually. That's fair. Yeah. So basically, there were so many different narratives and delusions going on, and they would toggle back and forth over the uh, over. It was over three weeks, by the way. If I didn't, I know I said that already, but it was over three weeks. I was sucked into this psychotic episode, and yeah, I would just switch between maybe like ten to fifteen different realities, and I was like playing according to those rule book that that rule book for that reality, depending on where I, which one I was on. Mm-hmm. Was one where I was in a video game, and to escape this terror, I had to just um, I had a game over, you know. So and one way to game over was to to unalive myself um, by throwing myself backwards. And, you know, smacking my skull against the concrete or the tile. And then another way was just, like, laying on the driveway and hoping that my dad would run me over with his truck, which is so awful. But that was, like, what I was hoping was going to happen. Like, I'd lay right there hoping that he'd come home and not know I was there. Yeah. Um, But the attention was not in those instances. It wasn't to actually unalive myself. I was just trying to reset the game in my mind. I was just trying to reset the game. Um, but I think I have, uh, you had mentioned it before that I was not fully committing even to like throwing myself back. There was all, there's still some hesitance with it. Um, so, you know, there was that girl in the news recently who like stabbed her, the guy she was dating over a hundred times. Um, her psychosis was so strong and convincing, unfortunately, that she like full sends yeah. the defense. And then I, I she, can you not- repeat that sentence? The audio cut out. I said she, I, I should not be laughing. This is not a laughing matter. Oh my God. But she, I said she full sent the emo- the delusions. Like oh. she sent. Yeah. Yeah. I probably shouldn't phrase it that way though. That's probably not very respectful. But she, uh, she probably 100% was in it. Like in it, in it. So what do you yeah. think, like, what made you not be in it 100% like that? You didn't hurt anyone or well, yourself through that process, but why not? I, I don't know. Um, I was not like, I, I was so, um, indecisive about everything like i couldn't figure out what was real and what was not so i kept going like is this it is this what i'm supposed to do is this but what if this is not what i'm supposed to do i don't know what i'm supposed to do so i I think it came down to just like i was freaking out and indecisive and i couldn't like fully commit to any of the realities because i didn't know which one was the right one and i kept Mm -hmm. trying to figure which one was and i couldn't so yeah with those specific instances i was trying to game over but there did come a point in the episode where i was just so confused and so defeated and i didn't know what to do that i actually did ask to die oh mm. to die myself sorry um youtube but i i was at a point where it was like i was wishing that someone would just end it because of how miserable I was and how low I felt and I just didn't want to feel anymore. I just wanted to go to sleep and be left alone. And that was the first time that I'd ever craved or desired to not be alive. Mm. Uh, And unfortunately it was almost like that sensation became my new low, even out of the episode. So when I was feeling low, even when I was better, um, it was, it, I just reached a new depth that I had not accessed before in my brain. It was like, it felt like a very chemical shift. Once I reached that point, it was like, that was my new low. And so um, I, I often felt that way even outside of the episode. And I had to work through therapy to alleviate those depressive symptoms and suicidal thoughts. Um, why, 
Well, how about this? So you, I remember you would have moments where you're right. It would like switch. I could tell like you were in almost like in a different reality or something. Cause there was one point where you were hearing things like neighbors from like far away across the like street or something like far, like that you can hear them or you thought there was a bomb or not a bomb of a, a, well, a bomb maybe, but like a, you were going to, we were all going to die. Yeah. You were on the driveway together. And I remember us like just relaxing outside. Cause it was like, you know, we we're outside. We we're trying to like be a part of something more than just being cramped in the house. And I just remember being outside and you came over. I, I don't remember how it happened, but I just remember you saying like the bomb is coming. And I was like, okay. Yeah. And I would hear like helicopters like flying over or planes flying over, which we, there is an airport by my parents' house, but, sure. um, and so there might've been an airplane flying over, but I would hear like airplanes going whoosh, whoosh. And it sounded like there was like a war zone going on up there. And yeah, I kept, kept thinking that it was going to be the end of the world. I kept being told that if I couldn't figure out this puzzle, like if I couldn't figure out what the voices were asking me to do, that the whole world would be destroyed. And I think by that point, I was like, it's it. I couldn't figure it out. I'm sorry. Like, it's happening. But I felt relief. I was like, just do it. I don't care anymore. Oh, you know what? Another, because I, I know some people ask, like, exactly what were the delusions. Another one was my dad showed me this documentary on the planet earth and it, had, uh, it like, was my suggestion yeah but you know what was weird about that was like i saw the documentary out of the episode and it's a very beautiful documentary but when i was watching it as the satellite was going over the earth the entire earth was on fire and burnt oh. out and destroyed like literally I, I remember that vividly that what i was seeing it looked like wally -E, you know like the whole yeah world was, like it's just over there's no life there's no civilization and all you see is the satellite floating around you know my dad was like so sweet about it he was like see sweetie there's the there's the ocean and there's the grass like he, i remember him like oh there's the the rings around saturn is it saturn that has sure. the rings, uh, Saturn's rings. Sure. um and so he's like see the rings around saturn and meanwhile i'm just seeing a, a planet that's totally destroyed and the yeah. voices of Ed were telling me um, it, this this is what's going to happen to your whole universe, and it's your fault. That's like that's happening. And my dad was like, looked so innocent to me, and I was just looking at him like, you have no idea what's coming, father. You have no idea, and he's just you know. <laughs> that must have been a maybe that was a different one because I remember I, I told your parents put on um like a Animal Planet like not Animal Planet but like a a, a, a an animal documentary because we were oh. trying to give you like peaceful things to watch but then it ended up being like this anxiety induced with like this mama bear cub and will her bear survive and i was like oh this is more anxiety inducing and i'm not even the one in psychosis like oh my gosh yeah, yeah i remember that one made me feel like i was in a like a hospital bed and like i was in like trapped and i couldn't escape and i was just stuck <laughs> on like like i couldn't like yeah. i felt like a person with alzheimer's just being told to watch this thing it was weird it was very i'm sorry Damn. For, Tried, you tried. Uh, another delusion was that I thought celebrities on the TV were talking to me. So, like, my brother put Billie Eilish on because at the time I was really enjoying a lot of her music. And sure. I thought Billie Eilish was telling me, like, you're, like, you're the savior of the planet. Like, you're going to save the world. It was so weird. It was so weird. Um, that is it is pretty surreal like it is pretty unbelievable and I can see why people have a lot of doubt or hesitation or people will be like this isn't like this is impossible and I think like that's what I'm hoping for the modern world as we do have the internet and we can hear different people's stories like have you heard there are studies being done that people who have schizophrenia around the world don't experience scary voices it's only in America in violent countries that they hear violent voices. I heard that from you in your one of your recent videos I'm shocked that's a yeah. Really I was oh, shocked. Speaking about hearing voices, I did want to talk about that because I know in one of your videos you were you said like that I was literally hearing voices. I I wouldn't describe it that way personally. Okay. If some, you know how you hear your own voice in your mind, like um your own mental yeah. monologue. That's what it sounded like. It sounded oh. like it was not auditory voices for me. There were some auditory hallucinations. Like, for example, when I was laying outside one time, I started hearing a bunch of rustling, rustling and rattlesnake noises, and it got closer and closer and closer and closer, you know, like that kind of stuff. 
Um, but I didn't experience like hearing whispers, like some people hear, you know, like actual auditory whispers. Mine was all internal dialogue, but the sensation was that it wasn't my internal dialogue. It was so clear to me that those thoughts were being planted in my mind. Like the hmm. way I was, it was like, these thoughts are not from my brain. Like someone okay. is, an alien is inserting them there. They're not mine. They were nef nefarious, you know, they, they were, they had, um, tone to them. Like one of them was like a, oh, like a Lord of the Rings, like Sauron, is that his name? That yeah. Guy? Like one of them sounded like that, but it was internal. If that mm. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Because I know there is a difference between those things. I, we, I was even talking on stream like a while back, like people were asking me if religious people hear the voice of God literally in their head. I was like, no, they'd have to go to the doctor. <laughs> like they just hear their own voice as yeah. we all do. It's like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So I was wrong on that. I thought you were literally hearing someone else's voice, but in that case, that kind of makes sense then that you didn't get diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah. Cause I think uh, schizophrenics hear a different voice, right? I, I could be wrong. I'm not a, I hope your audience knows. Yeah. They'll like, probably know better than me. I ha I'm not, I'm just speaking based my, on my own experience and understanding, but I think there's different types. I think some of them, like it doesn't, I think it just, could just be intrusive thoughts. But I could oh, be wrong. okay. Okay. I remember, I do remember contacting like people that I knew in like the mental health uh, field. And I do remember saying like, Hey, I think my friend has like schizophrenia or bipolar or something's going on. And I remember them, even them being like, I don't think it's that dude. And I was like, no, no, no. I've read some blogs. So <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how like clear it was. Like I said to the medical professionals that it yeah. was likely, I think it's, it had a lot to do with my history too. And then also the, the thing that like really decided it was like, just follow follow-ups to see like if there was any recurring episodes or anything like that. And yeah. it's been, I said it's been almost four years and there's not been any recurring episodes. There was definitely like a recovery period post episode where sure. I was still having some delusions. For example, um, one of the biggest like delusions during the episode was that anything electronic was a camera. So any flashing lights in the house, the microwave, you know, the little light on the TV, all of those were cameras and I was being spied on. And um, so after the episode, when I was driving and I saw a blinking light in the distance, my brain would be like, you're being watched. You know, like I would, I would. But you were safe enough that. to drive. Like doctors didn't mind that you drove. Oh, totally. Because it was just like, I was just aware of the thought. Like, okay. it was like, like an intrusive thought for like a second. And then I would be like, nope, that's just, you, you're just re in recovery. Yeah. And like those thoughts will go away eventually. Okay. And it's not. Okay. Just, I recognize they were there, though, for a little while. If you don't mind sharing, and you can absolutely say no, but I, I think initially after or during the episode, no, during, you were on anti-sex, right? Psychotics? Yeah, I, anti for, like, a little bit, right? Just to help calm your the brain? Yeah, during the episode and maybe, like, a couple weeks after. I can't actually remember, but to be honest with you, I don't really remember – them whole I, I could be wrong but remember i was on them for so long during the episode yeah the doctors eventually didn't think they were very necessary obviously no it was more so the, i think it was more so environmental because once enough people left the house there was finally a point where i got better like i literally yeah. just um you know it went from like uh maybe like five or six people in the house down to just three and then well, i think that, Initially, when it happened, we thought, oh, let's get all her family, friends, like coworkers, whoever like knew her to come and like ground her and it ended up being like a the wrong mistake. I think you ended up needing like a very calm and quiet yeah. space. So yeah. initially we were all like brainstorming, thinking like, what does she need? And we all thought like, oh, maybe like, like community. Yeah, well, and here's some do's and don'ts too, I think for people who are experiencing this. And again, my experience, this is just based on what I went through. It yeah. might be, it's going to be different for different people, but I think it's, um, I know what not to do. And one thing not to do is to like brainstorm in front of that person who's going Ooh. through it. It's going to come off like you're conspiring against them or they're going to feel guilt because they're going to feel like something's wrong with them or that you're a burden. It just creates like more feelings of like paranoia like what's going on they're talking about me what's happening 
Um, and then, um, yeah, I would just do everything you can to make that person comfortable and to de-escalate their emotions, to tell them everything's okay, that you're there for them. Um, the best I felt during the episode was a result of my brother putting on, like, he put on um, old school video game music that I grew up with and artists he knew that I liked to listen to that calmed me down. And that made me feel like a child. Like, I literally would also... Um, uh, some of my delusions were like that I was a baby or that I was a teenager and I would act that way or that I was an old lady with Alzheimer's. Like, I would act like at these different ages. Yeah, at these different personalities, I guess. Um, and so when my brother put on my uh, childhood music, it made me feel like I was 12 and I started, like, moving around like I was 12, but it was better than me running out of the house screaming 911, right? Yeah. Like, that was a good sensation for me at the time or my dad made me soup and he literally fed it to me and that was good too Cute. but you know, they had to read the room and read me because i swear if my mom had done the same thing my dad did it wouldn't have calmed me down the same way so mm. it's tricky you know it's tricky i yeah. I, don't, I wouldn't to feel bad or guilty if they don't know how to de-escalate someone who is experiencing psychosis because it's extremely tricky and it's i, I don't know if I would even be successful, like helping someone, helping de-escalate the situation if someone else was experiencing psychosis, it really depends on your relationship with that person. So, well, I tell my husband, I was like, my friend's gone through it, so if you go through it, I got you. And then I was like, I think. <laughs> yeah, because everyone's going to be different, and I think your background history with that person plays into how sensitive they are to your yeah. manner towards them and everything too. And so, I would just say, do your best de-escalate, remind them everything's going to be okay. Don't talk too much technical stuff. Like, don't talk about their job. Don't talk about, um, like, hospital bills, obviously. Like, nothing. Just, like, focus on them getting rest, getting better, and letting them know everything's going to be okay, that you're there for them. So another thing that's helpful, too, is to give that person space to be alone. One of the most helpful things for me was being under a blanket. Mm. I don't know. It, like... You know how I talked about at the dinner table, I kind of woke up for a second. When I would put a blanket over me, I would wake up and I would be like, okay, what is going on? Like, what can I do to rectify this? Like, what is happening? What is real? What is not? So I wasn't fully there, but I was like the most there that I was compared to like outside of the blanket. Um, and also that person needs to sleep. So you have to like give them space to sleep. Can also you talk about sleep? What's that? Because you didn't sleep a lot. I wouldn't sleep because I was paranoid, and I thought if I slept, I was going to die. Um, also, yes, we'll talk about sleep in just a second, but the last thing I want to mention is try not to stare at that person while they're trying to rest. Like, like just indirect, like, do pretend you're busy with something. Mm -hmm. Like, pretend you're reading a book or you're watching something um, on your phone, as long as that's not triggering them. You have to kind of, like, read the room. But I remember I couldn't sleep because, like, my mom would sit on the couch, like, at night, and she'd stare at me, and it was, like, the creepiest visual effect. It looked like a shadow yeah. was over me. Um, and so those are my recommendations in general. Um, and then as far as sleeping goes, one of the reasons I couldn't sleep was because I kept thinking if I fell asleep, my heart would stop beating. Um, I kept having this, like, hallucination of my heartbeat slowing down. Like, I could hear my heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And it felt more to, like, a panic attack where I felt like I was about to die. And one thing that helped a lot was my dad would hook me up to a heart rate monitor to show me what my heart rate was. Because I could not, like, my brain was telling me either my heart was beating really, really fast or was barely beating at all. And my dad would show me I had, like, a normal pulse. And that helped. That was the only thing that helped. Um, yeah. I might not help for everyone because if the psychosis is powerful enough, then you won't believe maybe the equipment over your delusions. But for whatever reason, it was enough for me to like recognize like, okay, well, I think the reason I was able to recognize it was because at that point, you guys were telling me that I was like, it was like a bad trip almost. That helped too. Being told, hey, look, it's just like you're going through a really bad acid trip or like a really bad shroom trip. That's all this is. It's temporary. It's temporary. Yeah. That helps I am curious, um, the irony is like you're, so one part of your brain wanted to unalive and the other part of your brain didn't want to unalive. Yeah. So you were almost like giving yourself like insomnia 
to an extent because you couldn't sleep. But then at the same time, like, do you think if once you like, what was a part of the recovery? Like what helped during the recovery? Was it finally getting some sleep? Because we know how important sleep is for the brain now. Like I try really hard to get my sleep in, even though I suck at it. But I know it's so important. So like, did that help technically move towards getting out of the psychosis eventually? I think so. I remember the day before I came out of it, I had a really good night's sleep. Nice. I woke up and I woke up to no one watching me. I just like woke up and had time to like be by myself and like kind of leave the room alone. And by that point, it was just my parents and my, my brother in the house. Um, and they all felt like safe uh, people nice. to be around. And so I, I like just walked out slowly and I was like, like, what's been happening like the last like or how long have I been like out of it and they were like oh it's been like a little over three weeks and I was like did everything actually happen or was it a dream and they were like oh it was real <laughs> we'll talk about it like little by little why don't you have some breakfast first and so just like getting slowly eased into um being out of it I guess yeah yeah, I, I remember just getting the updates and like, because uh, I had gone home by this time and uh, you had been just like, like you said, with your parents and your brother and like that was really great. And you know, you needed that small, like just close unit of people, I think. And the, the, they're both, they're all like very like quiet, I think. Um, and so that was probably very helpful. Um, and like you said, your coworkers and everybody was supportive. Like I genuinely think like not to use the privilege talk, but man, like if you had been born into a situation where your family didn't have money or some sort of resource or some sort of doctor or health insurance or the ability to go places or the fact that you had friends like me who could leave, like I was, I'm a YouTuber. Of course I could leave and come down and hang out and see what's up. Like I didn't have a job I had to report back to in that traditional way. And so I was really lucky to be able to do that for a friend because yeah, what if I had a regular job? That would have been so awful not to be able to come down and just see you and make sure everything was okay. Um, and so, like, community is so a part of this. Like, I do look at the homeless homeless pop population and wonder, like, how many of those people. Oh, yeah. I've seen some homeless people where I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's what I looked like when I was in my episode. That's exactly what I looked like. And, uh, yeah, the thought of that's really scary. Um if I was truly by myself alone, I could have ended up in a shelter. I mean, I was renting a place. Yeah. <laughs> and tell your viewers this, but I was renting that room. And in the middle of my episode, my family moved me out of that room and into their house. Like, yeah. I woke up. Before the episode, I was renting my own place in a different city. And then I woke up and I'm back living with my parents after, yeah. like, 10 years living in their house. Like, it was the weirdest thing ever. But I was on... Like, I wasn't working. I wouldn't have been able to pay my rent anyways. I didn't have the money for that. I was in a bunch of debt. Like, so, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to afford that place anymore. So if I was really by myself, where would I have been if I couldn't yeah. afford it? And Especially not only for rent, I would have ghosted that family for, I don't know how long I would have been in a hospital. But right. the family would be their issue. Like, they'd probably just start moving my stuff out thinking I just, like, left. Like, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, no. I could Elter, who knows? Who knows? Well, I think that's what's so difficult is because like out of everybody that I know, it would have been hard if you just looked at your like trope in the story, like educated in a field of like your industry, um, lo didn't live with their parents, like functional. And then all of a sudden it's like I think people associate this kind of experience with like, I don't know, like I don't know what to call it, but like oh, this wouldn't happen to me. It only happens to, like, those people. I don't know who oh, those people uh, are, but it sounds like it could be any of us. Yeah, I mean, when I saw people freaking out after smoking weed, I honestly thought they were just being dramatic. Like, I didn't even think it, like I said, I really didn't even think it was real. And if I did hear a case like this pre-episode, I would have assumed that, oh, well, that's, it's you. You have something that's causing it. It's, it has nothing to do with weed, but... Um, yeah, no, it could happen to anyone, um, and there's no way to know whether or not it's going to happen to you. There's just precautions people can take to avoid something like that from happening, and I think it really just comes down to not abusing the substance, because I do firmly believe that if I had just smoked 
you know, once in a while or leisurely without, you know, abusing it every day. I don't think I would have ever hit that point. I think mm -hmm. it was because I was smoking so much so often at such high levels of THC uh, mixed in with those other factors that caused this. So I certainly don't want to increase fear like around cannabis use. Um, it, sh it should be legal. It helps a lot of people. It does minimize um, sy symptoms, stress symptoms or pain. It minimizes pain for some patients. You know, there's a lot of benefits for some people, but um, I would just definitely encourage people not to abuse it the way that I did. It's one of my biggest regrets. So you wouldn't, because especially like with my fibro and stuff, like I will not lie that the problem, I'm, I'm the reason I think I am struggling with sleeping is partially because I'm not smoking anymore and I don't have weed and I don't have my edibles. And so part of me is like a little frustrated with that, but you know, I'm figuring it out. So do you, would you, would you recommend for somebody like never smoke weed or would you say like smoke it? It's probably not going to happen to you, but be responsible. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying it out, you know, um, I think in a lot of ways, um, smoking helped me. <laughs> like if I, again, my biggest regret is abusing it because, um, before smoking regularly, I had like a, a healthier relationship with it where it was like, I would just smoke with my friends or smoke once in a while. And I do feel like at least smoking a handful of times might open up someone's imagination in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise, uh, accessed or, that it might help them accept certain thoughts that they've been ignoring sober, you know, yeah. like I do, there can be some even mental health benefits to smoking. Um, but the only problem is, is that when you start making it a habit, like I don't believe it should be a daily thing. Um, I know that some people can use it to help them sleep, but there's ways to use cannabis without being high on it to help sure. you sleep or in, um, get it without the THC. And like so, the CBD, maybe? Because, like, a lot of people think the high concentrated THC without the balance of the CBD is why these episodes are happening in people. Because there's not the balance of that CBD involved, which in Croatia, where I'm at, there's CBD shops everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, again, if it's truly for sleep and you're just trying to relax your physical body, I mean, maybe it's also people need that mental, you know, relaxation. But I'm sure there's a way to do it so that you're not, like, totally out of it mm -hmm. i mean the way i smoked i would have like a high hangover the next day you know oh like I feel, yeah i would feel like shit the next morning and then mm -hmm. i want to smoke just not feel as like as shitty so i definitely had a problem um and i knew i had a problem but a lot of my friends were like i, I even asked some of my friends like am i addicted to weed and they were like no you can't be addicted to weed like that's not real it's just you know it's but you know what? You can be mentally, like, psychologically addicted to anything. You know? Totally. I, I think right now I'm addicted to my phone. I have YouTube on in the background like 24-7 and I go I get go crazy if there's not something playing in the background. Yeah. So, yeah, you can be addicted to anything. But one, one uh, indicator is that you want to quit, but you can't. Like you're – like I remember distinctly uh, throwing away my vape cartridges and sometimes the entire vape. And telling myself I was going to take a, a month-long break. I'm not going to go back to the dispensary for a month, only to go back like a week later. Sometimes yeah. even sometimes even three days later, I would go back and drop another sixty bucks on a cartridge, and uh, throw it away the next week, and then do it again. So I think I did that four times leading Damn. to the other. Yeah, I forgot so how expensive vapes were, bro. Mm -hmm, they're probably more expensive now. Damn. Okay, I'm curious. Um, the questions uh, want to ask a little bit more into the mental history like mental illness history part and they want to know does anyone in your family have a history of schizophrenia no no, no one with like even symptoms of schizophrenia or psychosis or anything like that no how did you know it was weed psychosis and not something else and i guess that's i'm assuming the doctors yeah that's it it's just doctors plus my therapist it's a four medical profession the fourth medical professional to tell me like with confidence not even just like it could be, no, they're like, this is very clearly to me, cannabis and new psychosis. And, and they were like, you're not the only case we've seen. Um, a couple of them told me that there's, there's been an increase. Um, and they anecdotally think there's a link between uh, vape cartridge highs and psychotic symptoms specifically. And they think it's because of the vapes having that capacity for such high concentrations of THC yeah. can what people used to smoke. So yeah. 
Yeah. I know it's really difficult for Fur 20 activists because they work so hard to destigmatize weed. And then I don't want this to be a part of that stigma stigma but i also want people to understand like the complexities of the world become or should be more nuanced and so we don't want to revert back to this like fear thing of like oh my god now we can't experience life because i'm afraid you know yeah and i don't want to live in that world where people are um uh criminalizing marijuana use or even the sale of marijuana like i like i said i think there are a lot of benefits for people and i think it could just be a fun thing for people to do like it doesn't even have to be like you have having a few drinks with your friends like Man. you know different do those things you know there's risks to anything that you do including riding a roller coaster you know there's like a risk with everything you do that's going to be like enjoyable or fun or good for you or whatever the case might be so my goal is not to increase the fear my goal though is to spread awareness that this could be um a consequence of smoking weed depending on your brain chemistry but like it can happen and it can yeah. happen to one who's partaking so you have to be aware that some people are going to have like you can have a bad trip on weed which is not a commonplace uh, piece of information that i think should be because if i had known that marijuana could potentially cause a psychotic episode um then i would have not been in so much fear during that episode as well because again there were times where i'd snap out of it and kind of be a little bit more sober-minded a little bit more myself but in those moments, the second I thought about what had been happening, like the second I was like, oh my God, like all of these things have been happening to me. Why is this happening to me? It would put me back into the episode because Damn. I didn't know what it was. You know? Yeah, like yeah, if, yeah. If I had known, oh, you've been having a bad trip and like, you're, oh, look, you're coming out of the trip, girl. Like, that's a good thing. Then um, I would have been freaking out so much. So I think more, I, I want people to be aware that this is something that could happen. Well, that's, you know, when I recently did my shroom trip before I came to Europe, I I had that same exact thought where I was tripping so freaking hard. I was like in a new dimension. I was with all these little Aztec gods. And I remember telling myself like, this is a shroom. So you signed up for this. This is exactly, the drug is doing exactly what you signed up for. You're going to snap out of this in like four hours. And I was like, this is the longest four hours of my fucking life. But I just remember thinking like, okay, it's going to end. And I just have to ride this wave, like ride this anxiety. But I had that reassurance. And I had a trip sitter to be fair, but I had that reassurance. Like I knew it was coming. And so every time I would come back to sort of like reality, even though it was really distorted, I almost had in the back of my thought your psychotic episode where I was like, oh my gosh, is this what she felt like? Is this what she was experiencing? But she didn't know it was like a trip. And I at least knew it was a trip. So I had a lot of reassurance power. I was comforting myself the whole time. So like you were going through that with no reassurance of why it was happening. Right. Right. That would drive me insane. Like I'm so, I think, impressed that you were able to like snap back so quickly. Like I said, you're like working, you're a functional part of society. People rely on you. And like if people saw you, they would never think like, oh, this person. Like, no, it's like you just like came out of it. Now and everyone's going to have that luxury. And I think that's why I feel so bad for anyone who goes through it without the right education because it probably would have turned most people's lives around. You know what I mean? Yeah, it could. I think it can help a lot of people to know that maybe that's what they're going through when it's happening. I think it could shorten the duration of the episode potentially or minimize the symptoms. Um, so yeah, like that is a big goal of mine is that people are aware that this is the case. And then also um, in my case, just to bounce off what you were saying regarding me, me bouncing back, um, I really have to credit my family with that because um i wanted to give up on everything coming out of that episode i wanted to quit my job i didn't feel worthy enough to do what i'm doing now because i had quote unquote ruined my life so so miserably and um my parents were like you are not giving up on your dreams you are not giving up on this uh career that you've invested so much time into that you are genuinely so good at that you have a calling for you're not Mm -hmm. giving up on Oh, but I wanted to, I wanted to. And even that job that I had at the time, um, my parents, my mom filed documentation with my, my, um, with my supervisor to ensure that I was put on medical leave. My mom was able to get me a doctor's note to show Amazing. that I needed to be off of work. You know, like I'm, I'm very privileged in those ways. A lot of people yeah. don't have that. 
and a support and they would have just lost their job. My my work thought I ghosted them because yeah. I literally went to that meeting, I cried, I lectured people, and I ghosted. Like I was gone the next day and I was yeah. gone for like two or three weeks. And um and my mom didn't really communicate with them until what, like two weeks into the episode or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Like, well, I just don't think they're the timing I don't remember it either, but I do like I think about that all the time. Like your parents knew what to do in a way that even I didn't know. Like, cause I, what? I was going to say my mom, the first day I came over, like that day that I thought I was Jesus Christ. And it was like the first morning after the episode began, she was like, sweetie, I think it's the weed. <laughs> she literally said that. Sweetie, I think it's the weed. And I was like, no mom, like you're just acting like an old conservative lady. Like Ugh. that's not, doesn't like have any negative effects like you're just That's so like, funny honey i think it's the weed like she, yeah like she thought it was the weed and it was so funny because yeah normally that is just something that uh, something boomers say like everybody says uh, like uh, just the doc the first doctor we spoke to was like okay we cannabis induced and i was like he's an old conservative yeah i don't like, trust him either outdated medical information like he's living in the 60s or the basically 50s. anyone who is anti-drugs and over the age of 60 i never trust their opinions about drugs i don't care so if you I... vote republican or democrat i don't trust you but then they end up pulling through in the end like i swear these parents who are they're not committed to the weed they're committed to their kids yeah yeah no yeah I my think parents that's what have, it is but they took care of me and um if they're the reason that i'm able to be like fully independent now at this that's amazing stage. so yeah I'm very like how many other people's parents would have known to contact their job i don't know i think a lot of people would have just been like well the, the job's gone i mean you lost it like you're going through something so forget the job but no my yeah. mom was like my mom was like well this is a serious medical issue we have <laughs> hospital we have hospital proof it's medical and i was like yeah. yes it is you know, yes, it is. And this is from a parent, like from parents who are, again, like more conservative. And so uh, they're not necessarily like the biggest advocates of mental health. Um, and so but my mom was like, oh, no, I know my rights. I know my daughter's rights. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, conservatives have a tendency um, to pull through yeah. when it fucking matters. I swear to God. Like, I think they do a lot of them. Very reliable. Say that again. Very reliable. I'd like to think yeah. all the time. I wouldn't know because I was not raised with liberal parents, but I, if I ever become a parent, I'm going to be a liberal parent. So I would like to think liberal parents are also reliable. I think they are. Even the ones I know, I can name so many of my friends' liberal parents who are also anti-weed to the point where they would also, I wonder, would they know what to do too? And I think they would know to advocate for their kids more than they would understand the weed part, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I guess that's just loving parents in general. Okay, this question I thought was a pretty big one. I'd be curious on how your relationship with yourself and your sense of trust in yourself was altered or hopefully healed after this experience. That's a really good question because it really fucked it up. <laughs> it really messed it up. We were all like, oh my God. <laughs> well, when I was a young adult, I was very like self-assured and confident. And I was like ahead of a lot of people my own age in a lot of ways. Um, but... The episode really, like, the fact that I had a mental breakdown in front of my coworkers, that's, again, I was always very professional at work, and people always told me that I, um, like, dressed professionally for my age. Like, even when I was, like, 19, I was, like, wearing slacks and, like, nice blouses to work, even though I didn't need to. It was one sure. of those things. So, anyways, um, I had, but... A lot of the self-doubt is not just from the episode and the mental breakdown in front of my coworkers. It's also because I had racked up a bunch of debt. I had started smoking weed every day. Like there was just so many things going on in that period of my life that um, I guess the psychosis was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It was like my low to accept mm -hmm. like, dude, you, you don't have your life together. Like you've been making really poor choices. Um, that made me feel like, oh, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. And like, maybe I do make bad decisions and like, maybe I just thought I was smart or thought I had it all together, but I really don't know what's going on. So I went from thinking I had everything together, even when I was smoking every day, I was like, eh, it's just a phase. I'll get over yeah. it eventually. Everyone in yeah. their twenties 
phase. I'm just going through a phase. But then when like shit hit the fan, I was like, oh, that wasn't just a phase. That was you ruining your life. Like, hello. But you didn't ruin your life. Uh, But I could have if I didn't. You could have. I mean, and I shouldn't say like, even if I didn't have the right support system, I could have worked my way back up slowly over time. Like even if I had had to leave my field or like whatever, um, there would have been a different path forward, of course. Um, but I, w- I d- would have ruined the life I have now, if not for my family. I would yeah. not have the life I have now. And I like my life comparatively to what it would have been, I think. Yeah. So, um, with that being said, um, how have I, like, grounded myself since? Have I healed? Have I recovered? I'm in a much better place now than I was out of the episode. I would say the first year out of the episode i was a mess i was Mm. like experiencing really high levels of anxiety i would mess up at work and i would like physically hit myself in the car like i'd hit my thigh or i'd hit my face um just out of impulse so my like i I had a lot of issues i had to work through and i was in therapy at the time and i obviously worked through all of this in therapy um and then the second year out of the episode, I was still experiencing a lot of anxiety and self-doubt. I think I was still going to MA meetings for just a little bit. Um, and then I started feeling a little bit better. I stopped going to meetings. I felt like I had finally figured out how to control my use and my temptation with weed. Um, and then I stopped hitting myself. I started feeling more confident at work as I got more and more positive feedback. And then flash forward to now, um, I feel really good about my life. I'm, like, in a very good place where, good. yeah, the trauma of the episode is not, like, with me every day. It's still there, but um, I'm pretty self-sufficient. I rent my own apartment. I have a full-time job that I've been with for a few years. I have a very good reputation at work. Um, I have a healthy relationship with my family and my mm-hmm. friends. And my life's not perfect. I'm still figuring out a lot of things um, as I go. But I'm in a good place and I'm feeling optimistic that it's only going to get better. Yeah. Do you have any fear whatsoever of any of the symptoms coming back without weed? No, I actually don't. I do have a fear if I were to use again that I would throw me into a full-blown episode. Or if I were to use another mind-altering substance that it could do that potentially. Um. But no, like on a daily basis, I have no uh, fear at all that I'll just get thrown into psychosis or something. Yeah. And even if I'm experiencing like the first signs of delusional thinking, I think I'd be aware that it's coming back. Um, I can't guarantee that though, because the brain is very weird and it has, it's very efficient in tricking itself into believing sure. things. I think the question that we can end on, and if you want to say anything else you can, is what is the biggest advice for supporting someone experiencing psychosis, which you went over before, but is there anything else that you would want to say even like out of it or in it, anything else on your mind in that regard? Because I think this is really why we wanted to talk about this, right? Uh-oh. Is to lend support for people and to, uh, you know, let people know they're being, they're victims of their brain. I think the, your goal should just to be to make them comfortable. Just remember that. Your goal is not to get them out of the episode. I mean, that is your goal. But, right. like, as to, like, in the moment, what actions do you want to take? Just ask yourself, how can we make this person feel comfortable and feel safe? Because that's going to be a requirement for them to come out of the episode if they're freaking out. Um, and so that's it just make them comfortable do not talk about them with other people in front of them even be careful if you walk out of the room and you're whispering because oftentimes like parents do this with their kids all the time they don't think their kids can freaking hear them in the next room they can hear you okay and in fact (laughs) you whispering makes their ears perk up even more yeah and with someone who's kind of going through psychosis if you're whispering about them in the next room it's gonna freak some of us out i can speak from experience and um don't laugh with other people as much as possible too like it might be innocent in your mind that you're like making a joke and trying to alleviate your own stress but that can make that person feel like you're laughing at them Mm. um and then uh remove anything that's unsafe so remove like knives and anything especially if they're threatening to hurt other people remove any kind of anything sharp I remember um, we I, um we hid the night we hid everything sharp in a bunch of towels and we hid them in places so you wouldn't find them. Um, 
the news story that came out, I was like, I never even picked up a knife. And then my brother was like, yeah, that's because we hit them from you, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> we did. That's the first thing. Like, we went around and, like, uh, psychotic proof the house, I guess. Because, like, you had a tendency and, like, um, you would just do things that just wouldn't make sense. Like, you would almost, like, you were almost, like, so smart, but so, like, in an episode. Like, it was so strange. Like, you would find ways to, like, disappear or run around, or, like, you would get naked and, like, run around. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, how did you feel? Like, do you remember the fact that, like, we had to, like, help you shower or anything like that? Like, do you even remember it? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember shower. I don't even remember showering at all, I don't think. I remember being held to go to the bathroom. I remember screaming at you like, I don't know what to do. And you were like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Between like, yeah, like there was a lot of just like, what are boundaries? Like, yeah. what are? I feel so bad. I, and that's, you know, I'm laughing about it now, like largely because well, it's not, part of it is because it's like so ridiculous that it's hard not to. Yeah. But of it is kind of dope because like obviously like my family saw parts of me that they should have never seen they heard me say things that i should have never said sure and it was dramatic for everyone and disturbing i think that's the best word is it was disturbing you know? it was like a weird horror film but just genuinely honestly from the everyone's perspective i think in some ways too it was kind of cool to see people come together to support you and like be there and be like aware of like well, we're about to cross boundaries or the fact that I just remember like your dad being very like loving and caring and like, like very like, you know, put a blanket over you and like guide you back into the house or say that again. It was so sweet. Yeah. Or like even the fact that I would try to like you, it was, it was a lot of like, uh, I would joke with you. I was like, man, we're like crossing a lot of boundaries right now. It's like, we're, we're coming really close right now. Like I would just sit there and I'm like, yep, this is what's happening right now. And like, it was just like, honestly, it was like a caretaker perspective. I think you become really neutral in those moments, uh, in terms of like the body or in terms of like helping someone go to the bathroom. Like it just becomes really neutral. You know what I mean? You're just trying to think like, well, this is a new experience, you know? Yeah, I could only imagine. It's yeah, kind of weird. I've never been on that end of the situation, which is interesting. But I, yeah, I don't even know what that would feel like. I think I'd be very stressed if I saw one of my loved ones going through that. And like I said, the advice I'm giving is uh, not to say that, oh, everyone should know this because I'm not going to pretend like I would handle it perfectly either. Like you, all you can do is your best. And if I hope that if this does happen to anybody, um, anyone's loved one that they give themselves a lot of grace in handling the situation and they don't blame themselves if yeah. they're one they can't help like because it's not easy like I said my dad and my brother were the most effective in like calming me down um, but a lot of that has to do with their like their nature in general as people and my dynamic with them um, like you and I have a very like sarcastic like you know silly funny like I would say it's our relationship's not as, like, warm, I guess, as, like, my relationship with my dad. Like, we, there is warmth between us, but generally it can be kind of aggressive and, like, sure. around with each other and, like, judgy, you know, like, we can be a little petty with each other. Sure, sure, sure. And, well, like, that kind of uh, energy, you know, as much as it's valued outside of, like, the episode, maybe in the episode is going to create feelings of, like, are you judging me? I'm questioning what you're thinking. Like, For sure. You're all like a very domineering person right like i'm much more submissive than you are in general and you're more aggressive than i am and so that kind of dynamic felt threatening in the episode and it's like how are you supposed to control that you know what i mean like you can't yeah. control or you know you are, you are so anyways yeah just give yourself grace if you can't figure it out um and just do your best That's all you yeah i do. think as yeah, i just think like as the person that isn't I really thought so well of myself, I think, going into that circumstance, thinking, like, I know what to do. And I just really was out of my element. And I do think my personality was probably, like, the worst thing for your energy, which is why I eventually just, like, left it in your family's hands and I left. And even though I was, like, really worried, I realized I was making it worse, which is, like, really hard to swallow as, like, a fam family or friend member. Like, you're so lucky that your family were the right energy for you. And I just wish I could have been another part of that positive energy. And I still, like, I 
still think like we've had to have multiple conversations about that and just making sure that I'm understanding in layers how difficult it was for you. Because even after my recent shroom trip, I like I went and talked to you and I said like, hey, you know, after having this recent shroom trip, I had another realization about the way that I treated you when you were in psychosis. And I think that's really difficult to swallow as a, a, you know, when you feel close to somebody and you think like, I'm there for them. I'm their girl. I'm their bestie. Like I know what to do for them. And then you realize like, like Mm -hmm. you fucked up bestie, like you fucked up and that sucks. But I also know like it helped knowing it wasn't about me. It was about you. But I think in order to, uh, in order to come to a better version of me, I had to make sure that I understood like in what way you were being impacted and I think that that was really helpful because you were weirdly so comforting to me (laughs) through the after you were coming especially after like you had come out of it for a while you and I had like I remember I had called you and we had kind of I think it was a call we had kind of like I think you had said like because I remember one time during the episode you like looked at me funny and you said something like um, are you like a bad guy or like, should I, can I trust you? And I was like, you can trust me. But the dilemma is that in my brain, I wanted you to trust me in a way that I only know how to take control of something, which is to dominate it. Yes. And, and you needed, the, yeah. Felt threatening to me where I was like, she's trying to control me. She's right. She's trying to like me. Like she has like bad intention. Yeah. Right. But, right. But meanwhile, you were just looking at it like you have a job to do and a job that needs to get done. Right. And I was like, like she's coming for me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It was like I couldn't – I felt like such a military yeah. – I felt, you know, and then I – We're like Toph's daughter. Like I, I was and literally – Cora, right? Yeah, yeah. I've seen Cora, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're Toph's daughter, the, like, police commander. Yeah. yeah I was, like, very was... much like this. And that's why, like, your folks came in and they were just like – <laughs> zenning out they were like yeah. peace and quiet in the home and i was just like everybody do this like, wait 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 you. your audio cuts out say it again i was gonna say the whole time my parents were looking at you as like oh you're the bestie and you're, you're like liberal and you know stuff about mental health and we don't so we're gonna like give you a little bit more of the we're gonna let you lead the way here because my parents were like i don't know what's going on and like you know, Brittany seems like she knows what's happening here. So, and then meanwhile, like, yeah, that ended up not being the, the right choice, but it makes sense why everyone thought that. Would, I mean, yeah. I called you before I called them, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I think I will say to give myself somewhat of a credit, I think it was good that I alerted everybody that something felt weird. Um, I maybe, I think it was good to like alert, but not to have everyone come to the house because I that, remember yeah where like everyone came and I was like whoa and like it made it worse and worse and more like the more people came and the more people were questioning what was going on with me the way yeah. we were versus- no, no no I meant like initially like just letting people know like hey she's driving like I'm coming over like something's going on but you're right it was my idea to have like the community come over and support you which was the mistake because like you didn't yeah. need a community <laughs> I would say less people better. Yeah. And, um, calm environment, safe environment. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. So now um, your life's back to a, a new normal. A new normal. And- yeah. And you're working and um, you're on your own, which is amazing. And you're doing your whole life. Um, is there anything, I guess, more to say on this subject? Any, I mean, I mean, there's so much hope in that. I hope people hear that first and foremost, that there's so much hope about recovery and there's so much to look forward to in terms of recovery and everyone's going to have a different journey with that recovery. Um, I think, yeah, actually I do want to talk about some of the delusions I was having sure. and talk about how. Um, the, I guess just in case anyone's going through the same thing, because I was looking for this when I came out of the episode, like, did anyone else have these delusions, or am I just insane for, like, these things happening in my brain? Sure. Uh, but one of them was that uh, we were in, like, a simulation, and each of us had, like, monkeys behind computers controlling us, like, we were their characters, or we were their avatars or something, and that these monkeys were, like, investing into my character, but then they gave up on me, and my character started, like just totally flailing and going downhill because the monkeys didn't want to invest in me anymore. Um, Another one was like that. I thought I had like 
a brain reader device in my head and that people were tracking I remember that. Another one was that the the Catholic Church and the government were in cahoots and they were very perverted and they wanted like to see very disgusting things in my household. I mean, that might be true. That might be true. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, like, I kept thinking I was being recorded for, like, the black market or something, which, like, the... Is that what it's called? The black market? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I kept thinking, like, that's... I was being recorded. I kept thinking I was being spied on by China. I kept thinking that uh, there were sex traffickers trying to steal me away. Um, I kept thinking that there was, like, a game that I had to, like, a puzzle that I had to solve by doing the right things, like, mm. by making sense or moving cups a certain way or moving things around the house a certain way would, like, get me out of this level and get me to the next one. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people, their, um, the way they spoke to me became very perverted and gross. I remember the doctor that I was working with, who's also a family friend, he kept saying that he loved me, you know, like very like compassionately and professionally. Like this guy's like, he's like a family friend and that's like a normal thing for him to say. But the way my brain interpreted it was like, he was hitting on me. Mm. Like he moved, which is not the case. So uh, it was just so many messed up things. Oh, and then Jesus Christ incarnate. um, Can't trust people in uniform. They're all like working against you. Um, that I had to kill myself or my family in order to save the world, yeah. or I had to kill myself in order to save my family, all that kind of stuff. And these delusions were so intense and so scary. And I just remember coming out of the episode, like, thinking all of these delusions means that I'm messed up as a person. Like, why would my brain come up with this kind of stuff? That's crazy. And I also thought that they would stick around for, like, the rest of my life. That yeah. part of me believe these things. Oh, another really big one. Actually, I think the worst one coming out was that there was this delusion or belief that there was a higher power. And again, I, I've been atheist my whole life. But the episode convinced my brain that there was a higher power, but that the higher power was malicious. Mm-hmm. And it was a total lie. It was like a lie that God is kind and benevolent. The reality is, is that there's this higher being that's all powerful and all knowing it has influence in our lives, but they're purely selfish and they're just sucking the energy out of us like the matrix or something, you know, it was like that. Yeah. Like, that's true. And even out of the episode, I knew this was false, but my brain still, what's the word I'm looking for? It's still, um, believed, um, I guess held like, on it, to. Yeah. Like my brain still like at its, at, at my was core, convinced. Like, it was convinced, but I like rationally knew that it wasn't true, but sure. it was, yeah, it, I just, but there was a belief in the back of my head that it was true. It was it, not easy to explain, but I thought I was going to always believe that or like have a hard time shaking that belief that I was going to be stuck with this very negative worldview, but that's pretty much gone now. And I can't even tell exactly when, but I would say about maybe like two and a half, three years after the episode is when I can confidently say like all of those delusions are pretty, none of them are an issue anymore. Mm. And, and I'm, I can't even say I feel more like myself pre episode because yeah, it's just a new version of myself. It changes you. How does it not change you and transfer? It changed, it changed me as a friend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, literally. No. Oh, okay. I feel like when you're talking about all the delusions, doesn't it sound like so many people you hear on the internet talk and tweet and like. The weird thing is, is like a lot of the conspiracies, like simulation love theory or whatever, um, I had only heard the name of, but when I was under psychosis, it like pretty much just made up all this information based off of those like conspiracy theories or like, oh, oh, one of them. You know, again, I don't even know enough details to, like, summarize this uh, this conspiracy theory. And I don't even know that it's, like, completely false. But you know how, like, some Hollywood stars apparently will go to, like, the forest and they'll wear, like, white capes and they'll, like, have a bonfire or sure. whatever? I don't know. There's, like, I mean, maybe some people know what I'm talking about. But, and again, this is just random stuff I just read in passing on the internet that I've never dived into. But, like, you'll hear stuff like that. All of those things came into play during my episode as realities. Like, yeah. where I was like, oh, like, when people are, like, burning babies and making sacrifices, da 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 Even though I've never entertained this in real life, like, that's what I believed. Oh, or um, the island, the island guy. Epstein? 
Epstein, yeah, Epstein's Island. That was I kept thinking I was gonna get stolen and taken to the island or something, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, it was just yeah. messy. Oh, the one delusion I forgot to mention was um, like me thinking uh, people heard that I thought I was the savior of the planet, but I also thought that the, the CIA was gonna helicopter me away and make me the president of the United States. Like I kept <laughs> thinking I was gonna be the president. Girl. <laughs> I know, but that was another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I really, my heart goes out to all these people I hear. And sometimes, like, that lady I met in New Mexico that one time who was, like, trying to, she definitely was trying to help me. And I was like, sis, you don't know what you're talking about, girl. Like, she's like, 5G's going to blow up your brain. Girl, I've had 5G for a long time. My brain's doing fine. I wonder what the difference is between, like, conspiracy theorists who, like, are generally paranoid about things and, like, I think it's education. I- I'm telling you it's education. Yeah, because they actually, like, do their research and, like, believe in that stuff. Versus me, when I was under psychosis, this is something I wanted to mention, too, is, like, you're not choosing to believe whatever's going on. It's almost just like your brain is flipping these switches and, oh, you believe this now. This is your reality. This is truth. And you're going to play by these rules in this moment. And it's not consistent. Like I said, I toggled back and forth between a bunch of different, like, rules uh, sets of rules and you just have no control whatsoever like it's just you know this is truth and now you're reacting based off of that truth and you cannot yeah. shake that is what it is i think that's the most like people kept asking me like in my original live stream like what's the difference from you know the conspiracy theorist to the parrot to the to the psychosis and it's basically that like there's a difference between thinking you know the answer because like we here we're in politics we understand what people say when they say things like don't take the shot and do this like they're not in psychosis they just have a badly educated like informed opinion versus like a real like a delusion which is why again my heart goes out i think the homeless population because again i really think if you didn't have family and friends and i think if you didn't have the resources you did in society there is a high probability that you would have been another homeless adult on the street just because like where would you have gone like who would have put you where who would have paid for what? It's on like, because I'd like, I don't know, it's hard. I'd like to think that if I was hospitalized, I would have gotten the care I needed eventually. I'd like to think I'd come out of the episode. I don't know if there's cases where like, maybe it would have just been a one-time drug-induced psychosis, but then it turns into something more severe because it's not treated appropriately. I don't know. There's no guarantee but it could have happened so that I would have been hospitalized and I would have come out and then I would have had to, I probably would have lost my job because I couldn't do the paperwork stuff by myself. Like I really, I couldn't, I was so ashamed that I had that meltdown in the meeting. I didn't even want to show my face again. So I probably would have lost my job and I would have had to start at like a minimum wage job and probably like beg people to let me live on their couch. And it would have just been a really unstable life for me if I came out. Now, if I didn't come out because maybe because remember how I wasn't trusting people in uniform? Like, how would I have ever felt safe in a hospital? I don't know. Like, yeah. Because I came out of it after sleeping in my own, well, not my own bed. It was a, a bed in my parents' house, but it was, like, in pretty much my own room. And I was with family, who I had trusted in initially when the episode started. But when the episode started initially, I was not trusting anyone in uniform. So, right. again... And I wasn't taking medication either. I forgot to mention that in this video too, that uh, I didn't trust pills. And so I would like put them under my tongue and wait for people to leave and then try to spit them out kind of thing. Yeah, I found a lot of your pills on your pillows. And I'd be like, oh, she didn't swallow it, bros. And then we had to come up with like interesting ways for you to swallow it. But then you didn't trust anyone. To, but to be fair, you thought you were, honestly, in some ways, your brain was so protective. Like if you were really being kidnapped, it would have been really annoying. But like, you, you know, you would you have been really sneaky, but you weren't being kidnapped. And so it was even more annoying because I'm like, bro. <laughs> But imagine like doctors in these facilities like what would they have done with a patient like me and i would have not trusted any of them like i yeah. really don't know what it would have taken and then they wouldn't have context into who i am as a person right either. so it's like they're probably just gonna look at me like some crazy lady you know people's prejudice and bias like totally make them treat people differently and i just think that that's why again we didn't want you to get locked up into a facility and we were like we'll give her home during care COVID. COVID, during covid no, no visitors nothing that's an insane, insane. Yeah. 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 Well, here you are now. Very exciting. I didn't think you would want to do this interview, so I really do appreciate it because I think it will give people a new perspective. I mean, I'm just so glad that they're already reacting so positively to my initial video 
because I would have seen a story like that before and not thought much about it. And now I'm like, well, now that I have a friend who went through it, it's kind of one of those things I look out for. And I do consider it, in, you know, in people now. And you can't control your beliefs and your behaviors in a lot of ways, too. I, I hurt my mom when I was in psychosis. I pushed her. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I think I pushed her into the shower, in fact, but... She didn't well, fall, but you did. You shoved her. No, I know she didn't fall, but I did push her hard. And I felt... But I felt bad immediately after. Like, I remember yeah. being... Like, I couldn't commit to anything fully, but I still went even that far. So, and I... Again, I would have never chosen to do that if I wasn't delu literally delusional. So, yeah, I think some, some compassion and empathy... Or, Compassion and understanding is warranted with anyone who's experiencing psychosis. And I guess my biggest goal in doing this is just to spread awareness so that people know that it could happen to them and that there's things that they could do to like minimize the chances of it happening and that um, they'll be prepared if it does happen to them or like aware that they could just be having a bad trip. And yes, it can happen on marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it. And I look forward to reading the comments. I'm sure you will as well. I will. And, you know, of course, I hope people make corrections because I'm not a professional regarding any of this. So I'm sure I used wrong terminology or referred to things maybe not the most accurately. So if people want to chime in to spread further awareness, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me and it's kind of cathartic to be able to like share my story in a lot of ways so i i really do appreciate it i'm really glad i really am and um who knows maybe we'll do another follow-up or something if there's really good questions but no pressure i obviously don't want you to feel pressure to keep talking about it but i i'm just thinking back right now of like all the things we didn't talk about because it was there were so many things that happened like I write a book um, you could felt, write a book it felt like i lived eight, eight different lives in that yeah. those three and so, like, and each one had its own unique experience or delusion. I had nightmares and dreams also that stuck, stuck with me for over a year. Like, the, the impact of the dreams kind of messes with you, too. So there's definitely lots of different uh, things that we could dive into. But you're right. It would take a very long time. It would. So it would. Say that again? I guess we'll just start here. I guess we'll start here. Okay, well, I won't keep you any longer. Thank you for being here, and I will see you guys in the next podcast. Bye. In my head, in real life, I'm in bed. My belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, because I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da,